stealth technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job, to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. Today, I am pleased to have with me in the studio Justin Gallivan, a program manager since 2014 in DARPA's Biological Technologies Office. Justin earned a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and received his PhD in chemistry from Caltech. For 14 years prior to arriving at DARPA, he was a professor in the chemistry department at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. There he led a research program in synthetic biology, which is all about uncovering the rules and genetic programs by which cells behave and operate, and then to learn how to manipulate those rules and programs so that bacterial, fungal, plant, and animal cells can make drugs, fuels, coatings, and other useful molecules and materials. At DARPA, Gallivan continues to be driven by some of nature's own most audacious biological feats, such as the growth of a great sequoia redwood tree from a seed. What if it were possible to leverage biology's own evolutionary honed powers of chemical synthesis, growth, self-organization, self-healing, and reproduction in the context of our built landscape of buildings, roads, vehicles, and other constructions? That is the sort of question Justin is asking. Justin, thanks for joining me in the studio today. Glad to be here, Ivan. Let's start by talking about your background and how you became interested in science in general and in chemistry and then synthetic biology in particular. I actually started out, I was very interested in physics. I was inspired by people like Richard Feynman, and you know, he told these wonderful stories. He seemed like an incredibly interesting guy. It's actually one of the things that brought me to Caltech. I thought, you know, if this is a place where this character could do such uh, great science, it was a place that I wanted to be. I quickly realized after about a week in college that I was not going to be a physicist. <laughs> but nevertheless, I liked the hard sciences. So uh, chemistry seemed like a, a good option. And I always liked the idea in chemistry of the ability to create things that didn't exist before. At its core, chemistry has an analytical side, so we understand the world around us by studying it. But it also has a synthetic side, which means creating new opportunities. And that was something I was really drawn to. Interestingly enough, I was sort of put off by biology. My biological education, at least formally, pretty much ended in the ninth grade. But um, as time went on during uh, graduate school and postdoc, I went from this time where the word DNA in a seminar title meant do not attend um, <laughs> to a point where I really started to respect the remarkable chemistry that biology does. I ultimately concluded that no matter how good of a chemist I was, that biology would always do better. So we asked the question, OK, well, can we harness the power of biological systems to essentially do our bidding for us? So how can I reprogram a system that wants to do its own thing and get it to do the thing that I want it to do? And that led me into this area of synthetic biology. So we were interested in taking advantage of some of the properties that bacteria, just simple um, microbes, could do, their ability to make stuff, their ability to sense stuff. And I got really interested in programming that. Before we talk about the two programs that you're running here at DARPA, I would like to hear about the sequence of events that led you from your long experience at Emory as a professor to DARPA itself. So how did you actually end up here? So it's a funny story. I was at a meeting in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, which is beautiful laboratory, famous laboratory on Long Island. Famous um, for molecular biology. For molecular so biology, molecular yeah. So Jim yes. Watson, the mm -hmm. structure of DNA, that's, we we were meeting right outside of his office. We got to see him um, walk through, coming back from his tennis matches. And I was there as part of a short course on synthetic biology. So the organizers had brought in faculty members from around the country, around the world. And about that time, DARPA had announced the Living Foundries program, which is one of the seminal synthetic biology programs here at DARPA. Um, there and can was you just tell listeners what was the crux of that program? So the crux of that program was engineering microbes to produce new molecules and to reduce the 
the time of the design, build, test, learn cycle to do that. So instead of taking a decade and a billion dollars to generate a product, they wanted to reduce the time down to you know, maybe days or weeks and reduce the cost dramatically. DARPA had just put out a call, nearly $100 million of investment, I think. And needless to say, people at this meeting who were all in this area got really excited about it. But we also were sort of amazed by the in some sense, the audacity of what DARPA was asking. And I, I was getting really excited about this, and I, I got to talking to some of the younger faculty members, so these are mostly assistant professors that had organized the meeting, and they had mentioned that you know, DARPA was expanding heavily in the synthetic biology arena. They were looking for program managers, and it's the program manager job is kind of an interesting one in the sense that we're all temporary. DARPA doesn't hire permanent staff as program managers. We have an expiration date on our badge. Mine is 30 December 2018. That gives you a so sense of urgency, doesn't it, it? It certainly does. So in order to come you know, do this job, you essentially have to leave what you were doing before with the expectation that this is only going to be a temp job. So for the folks that come from academics, you more or less have to have a tenured position if you intend to go back. Because early in your career, you can't do this and be an assistant professor at the same time. It just wouldn't work out. But since I had already had tenure, a lot of my colleagues said, you would be great. You know, you know the field. You have the ability to take a break. Ironically, after about three years up here um, on leave from memory, my dean said, are you coming back? And something I never thought I would say <laughs> is I said no. So I gave up a tenured faculty position, a lifetime appointment, something I worked incredibly hard for and sought as sort of the end-all, be-all of a career, and I gave it up. <laughs> so I am currently... Uh, you know, serving at the pleasure of uh, the DARPA leadership and don't know what I'm going to do next. All right. But that also is an indication to me that you developed a certain kind of devotion and excitement about the programs that you are involved with, maybe more so than you even expected. So let's talk about the two programs. The first one goes by the short name of BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, which stands for Biological Robustness in Complex Settings. What is its status now and what do you hope to achieve with it? The origin of that program goes back a couple of years before I joined the agency. Synthetic biologists got good at engineering bacteria to do what I would call parlor tricks, little cute things that worked well in the laboratory. An example was engineering bacteria such that when you expose them to light, they would change color. So you could do photography. You could take a Petri dish. You could shine light and uh, you know, shadows and so on. And you could take bacterial photographs. You know, cute kind of demonstrates the possibility for the field. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not going to put digital cameras out of business. <laughs> so... I myself had been engineering organisms to follow small molecules with the idea maybe that you could chase down pollutants in the environment. So you'd have a bacterium that not only wanted to eat the oil, but actually could sense the oil and follow it around if you wanted to clean up the environment. And in doing all this, the question I would inevitably get asked is, okay, when are you going to transition this to the field? And my answer, quite honestly, was never because the systems that we were building worked fine at 37 degrees Celsius in a, a Petri dish, in a sterile environment with the presence of antibiotics to keep any competition away. So we were literally coddling these bacteria and they could perform in that environment. But if you said, okay, I want to take something that I engineered in the laboratory and I want to put it in this contaminated site to you know, clean up what was there, it would never work because there are microorganisms that live everywhere. They've established their niches. Okay, So introducing this little weak laboratory strain of E. coli, it wouldn't survive. It's just it, it wouldn't work. And just on another angle, was there even at that time a regulatory framework <laughs> that would enable you to go from the lab out into the field? There is. Mm -hmm. it, like many regulatory frameworks, it's a little bit complicated, but it does exist. But we were so far away from that that even the notional idea that we would like to do that was almost out of the question. It's, you know, Regulation wasn't going to stop us from being successful here. It was the science itself was going to got stop it, us. <laughs> so, um, the challenge, as I saw it, was we needed to be able to engineer organisms that were robust enough to survive, 
You, of course, have to deal with this problem of evolution. So when you have large population sizes, evolution occurs by mistakes. Okay, When DNA gets copied incorrectly, it introduces mistakes. And we are Most all are, grateful for billions of years yeah. worth of mistakes, aren't we? <laughs> exactly. The process works. The public concern often is, oh, you're going to create a, you know, a superbug. And my concern, actually, it was at the other end of the spectrum, that anything we build is going to break. It's just going to be too fragile. So we have to be mindful of both. If we want to engineer microbes that are um, resilient enough to do the job, but make sure that they are not innovating on the fly. And one of the challenges there is this notion of engineering robustness into systems. If you talk to hardcore engineers that build things like airplanes. There are many ways to make sure that airplanes fly safely. Okay, We have multiply redundant systems. We have lots of sensing, control, actuation, and so on. So we've gotten to the point now where air travel is incredibly safe. And there's entire engineering disciplines that help support that. So I would talk to these engineers who are used to working in the you know, macro physical world and say, okay, how do you deal with uncertainty in, say, a biological system. So as an example, if you're thinking about an airplane flying, you can make reasonable guesses as to what environment it's going to see. You know, I know the temperature range that it's likely to see. I know how high it's going to fly. I can model the stresses on the wings, What et kind of winds it might encounter exactly. along the way. Exactly. You can draw a box around it, right? And engineers are very good at saying that within a certain parameter space that you know this should operate as expected. And then beyond that, you know, all bets may be off, but we've done a pretty good job of drawing a box around the problem. But in biology, it's a lot more complicated than that because we don't always know what an environment is going to be like. Um, moreover, you have this pesky thing of evolution, whereas in physically engineered systems, when something breaks, generally the fitness, for to use a biological term, of the object goes down, okay? So let's say part of the airplane breaks, the performance of that aircraft is generally not going to get better. Whereas in biological systems, breaking is innovation. So it's possible that through mutation, an organism acquires a new function. It grows faster. It outcompetes its uh, colleagues. When I would talk to the engineers and say, you know, is there an analogy in the mechanical world? The answer is no. That if the airplane breaks, it doesn't start flying twice as fast and twice as high. Its performance goes down. So, so there was sort of a, an intellectual barrier there that the people that think about engineering robust systems weren't as of yet, thinking about biology, and it brings new challenges. And I recognize this, but I'm not an engineer, so I had no idea how to solve this. So when I came to DARPA, I had the convening power of the purse. I could sculpt a program that basically asked, can we transition synthetic biology from a laboratory curiosity into the real world? So one of the great technological advancements of the last um, decade or so is the dramatic reduction in cost of DNA sequencing. So we can study the DNA that's out in the world, and there's a lot of it. And by doing that, we started to recognize that there's this incredible diversity of microbes that grow on us and in us. It turns out that if you were to count up the number of cells in your body that are yours that have your DNA, and then compare that to the number of cells of bacteria that live on your skin and in your gut, those numbers, there's still a little debate about it, but they're approximately comparable. Okay, So you are being driven by your bacteria. They help you digest your food, for instance. They affect us in profound ways that we're just beginning to discover. And they just suggest, let, me, let me get this uh, straight, though. You, so you're essentially telling me that I am half bacterial. More or less. More or less. Yes. So this opens up the tantalizing possibility that by manipulating those bacteria, we can develop therapeutics, for example, so to treat diseases of the gut. An interesting aside, there is a typically hospital-derived infection called uh, C. diff 
commonly or Clostridium difficile. Essentially what happens in hospital settings is that when people take a strong course of antibiotics, essentially it clears the bacteria out of your gut. Now C. diff lives in this very these specific locations within your guts. It kind of hangs out in between some cells, and normally it's held in check by everything else that's in your gut. Right, and just because some listeners probably have heard the term, we are talking about here about the, the microbiome right here, the, here the microbiome right. of the gut. When you're talking about the bacteria over all of us, then that's the entire microbiome on our bodies. Yes. But here you're talking about the microbiome. Of the yeah, gut. so specifically in the gut. So what happens is that after antibiotic treatment, gut clears out. C. diff says, oh my God, this is great. You know, it's like it's expanding into a vacuum and it makes people very, very sick. It can be deadly. The observation was made that perhaps by repopulating the gut with normal gut bacteria, you might be able to knock down a C. diff infection. So where do you get those bacteria to repopulate the gut? Well, <laughs> um, the palatable terms these days are intestinal microbiota transplant. But we are it, talking about fecal material, however, correct? I, I'm going to yes, liberate you poop, from having to it say it yourself. It is a poop transplant. Yeah. So, and it works. If you eliminate a microbial community, you can replace it with a different community and restore function. Now. It's great it works. I mean, it's something like 95% successful. But aside from just the ick factor, if you had to design a solution to this problem, is that the best you could come up with? <laughs> that you would literally take somebody's poop and stick it in you? So you know, we started asking this question, could you build more defined communities from scratch that might have the same function, but wouldn't carry all the extra baggage? So you know, in that poop, there's a lot of other, you know, potential viruses and other bacteria that maybe you don't want to reintroduce into the gut. So we, we got very interested in this idea of building microbial communities that can perform a specific function, but have much more defined composition. This would, of course, be a, a tremendous service in a public health sense because so many people have gastrointestinal issues that seem to be related to the microbiome. So if you can come up with ways that are more palatable in yeah. a sense to, to treat that, that would be really tremendous. And it's also a, it's a Department of Defense-specific problem as well. So when soldiers deploy to places like Iraq and Afghanistan, they are exposed to new microbes, whether it's something in the water and so on. Traveler's diarrhea. Many of you out there may have suffered from it. It's not fun. And not only can it ruin a vacation, but if you think about from a DOD perspective, if you're taking young, healthy people, you're deploying them in theater with the expectation that they're going to do a job right away, and then they're sick, that's no good. So one way that you could think about maybe solving this problem would be to find a way of engineering a robust community in the gut that more closely matches where they're going. And maybe you transition that community stateside. So maybe you get a tummy ache but you're here, you can be treated, you're fine, and then you deploy overseas and don't have to worry about being uh, knocked out of the game right as you arrive. If you were to characterize the status of the program BRICS now, how would you uh, describe uh, it? it? It's going well, I'm actually very pleased. So when we started that program, we realized that the science behind the microbiome is changing incredibly rapidly. When we launched the program, we didn't say specifically that we were going to solve this microbial engineering problem because I felt that those problems weren't quite as well defined as we wanted. So what we did was we said, what are the tools and technologies that we will have to develop that allow us to engineer microbial communities or microbiomes that can function in complex environments? Because we thought that there were going to be some commonalities. So a microbial community in your gut has to deal with changing environment, right? One day I, I drank a Diet Coke, I had a burrito for lunch, then I ate a salad. So there's all sorts of different stuff flowing through there. So what we said was, if you have the ability to engineer a microbial community to perform a defined function in some suitably complex environment, we figured we would learn enough lessons that we could then take that to maybe a different function in a different complex environment. So that there are going to be some primitives or commonalities in terms of the problems that you would have to solve to engineer a community that's going to function. Whether I ultimately want to re-engineer a gut microbiome 
or a skin microbiome or a soil microbiome, there are probably some commonalities to the solutions there. Okay. And how many research groups do you have working on this at the moment? Uh, right. Uh, overall in the program, it's probably about uh, a dozen. And they've come up with some truly creative solutions to some of the challenges that we gave them. At the beginning of the program, we said, we want you to engineer a community that has an impact on an organism in a rational, predictable, safe, robust way. And we didn't specify what you know, the test case had to be. We let the performers, the folks that um, came with ideas, define their own space. We, we defined how complex it could be or needed to be, but we didn't say engineer the gut microbiome of X. Um, so we got some really creative solutions, including some that were unexpected. So some of the ones that I would, I'd say were a little bit more in line with what we kind of thought would come in was we have a group at uh, the Wies Institute at Harvard led by Pam Silver. She and her group now have engineered a microbe that can sense inflammation and it changes color when it senses inflammation. So a diagnostic It's function. a diagnostic. So it can reside in the gut of, they're using animals, so they're using a mouse. It can reside in the gut of a mouse for uh, something like 100 days without mutating. So this was one of the things that we were worried about. I thought this was going to be a huge problem, that the systems were going to mutate away. It turns out they don't, actually. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. They've shown that you can detect inflammation in the mouse gut basically by looking at the color of their poop. <laughs> so if there's inflammation, the mice poop blue. So you can imagine ultimately using this as a diagnostic. One of the other more surprising test cases that a group at the University of Texas Texas, led by Nancy Moran, came up with was the microbiome of the honeybee gut. So we were definitely not expecting this, but it, it turns out that the honeybee is a really interesting test case. So unlike you and I, who have a lot of different microbes in our guts, the honeybee has, depending on the day, somewhere around eight or nine different species of bacteria. So much simplified. Much to simplified. Us. So it's not one, but it's not a thousand. So we thought that this was a really useful test case because it's complicated, but not irreducibly complex. And what also is interesting about the honeybee is the honeybee is a social animal. It displays learning and memory, so you can train honeybees to do tasks and so on. So what the Texas team was interested in doing was manipulating the gut microbiome of the honeybee to see if we could alter their learning and memory. And it turns out that this actually works. It turns out that um, there is something that uh, known as the gut-brain axis. So there's an incredible number of uh, uh, neurons that go from your brain and synapse onto the gut. If you think about it, you have the gut-brain axis, and then inside the gut you have all these microbes living, and they're doing something. And it turns out that there's essentially a gut-brain microbe axis. So the microbes in your gut can actually tickle your brain <laughs> via the molecules they produce, how they interact with the cells in the gut, and so forth. Absolutely amazing. So potentially opening up a door of engineering my own gut microbiome in a way that might make me a better learner. Okay, so you, that you've wet, cool. <laughs> you that would be very cool. So we're you, not there yet. But not, <laughs> you know, so you've wet my appetite. You've only told us about two. I know you said there's about a dozen other groups. We cannot get into all of them. Uh, in fact, I want to move on now to. The, to the second program, which is fairly new, um, and this one goes by the acronym ELM, and that stands for Engineered Living Materials. And I know in an earlier discussion, one of the kind of metaphors that came up as we were talking about this was sort of a really beautiful one of when you think of where a forest come from, and then you think of the seeds that are the beginnings of all of those trees that collectively become this incredible landscape of, of a forest. So, but what you're thinking about that sort of biological brilliance and landscape in another way. So talk to us about ELM, what it's about, and what the status is. One of the great 
perks of this job is that we get a pretty high level uh, view of the technology landscape. And I had gone to a, a meeting called Biofabricate, and I had met a group from a company in New York called Ecovative. And what Ecovative was doing at the time, and what is actually I think the core of their business, is they were taking fungi in particular, so mushrooms, and in particular the mycelia, which are the parts of mushrooms that grow underground. And if you've ever walked out on your lawn one morning and say, you know, you see mushrooms, like where the hell did those come from, right? They grow really fast, okay? And what Ecovative was doing was they were taking this organism and mixing it with the cheapest agricultural waste they could find. So we're talking corn stalks that are ground up. Um, apparently there's a market for ag waste futures. <laughs> Who knew? What they would do is they take the, the waste, they would take the mycelia, they would put it in a, a mold, um, a physical mold. And after a few days, the mycelia would grow to fill the voids, and they would get a material that essentially has many of the properties of polystyrene, so styrofoam pack material, and they can sell this as a packing product. The mycelia of the fungal system, those are more fibrous kinds of parts of it, not the mushrooming bodies that right, we normally right. think of. But in they a way, can produce mushrooms, but in, in here, it just kind of ends up looking almost like a foam. Okay. So, and I thought this was so cool because polystyrene is, I'm holding a polystyrene cup as we speak, is one of the per most useful yet pernicious substances on earth in the sense that it is so inexpensive to make, it is cheaper to make virgin polystyrene than it is to recycle it, and it tends not to go away. Whereas these mushroom-based materials, if you throw them in a compost heap, they, they go away. And so I was really intrigued by this idea of growing materials. And from a DOD perspective, I was particularly interested in this idea of growing materials on a specific site. And one of the things that the Ecovative folks had shown me was that they could take their mushroom materials that are not particularly dense, but if you put them under heat and pressure, you can get a material that's more or less equivalent to fiberboard. I thought, this is cool. You can essentially grow these materials quickly. Now, if you think about the Department of Defense, we operate all over the world. If you think about a rebuilding effort in Afghanistan, and let's say you need to get a pallet of plywood there. Now, the DOD has the world's best logistics uh, system out there, but Shipping heavy pallets of plywood across the world into danger zones, to me, seems it's necessary, but silly, right? It costs a lot. It costs fuel. It's dangerous. Why couldn't you ship a seed, or effectively a seed, like a starter, and then grow the materials that you want on site? So you reduce the logistic burden, you reduce the cost, you increase safety because you're not trying to truck inherently low-value materials across dangerous terrain. And then if you take this a step further and say, well, what are some other remote places we might want to eventually produce materials? If we ever decide to live on Mars, there's no Home Depot up there. <laughs> We're not going to get there by just shipping everything we need. We're going to have to be able to grow infrastructure. So the ELM program really gets at this early stage of growing materials. Oh, and by the way, we want the materials to remain alive. So in packing material, it's obvious you may not want that to remain alive, but living systems have great properties, right? They can self-repair, they can sense and respond to the environment. So could you imagine having a, a structure that upon damage or insult repairs itself, much in the way that you do if you get a cut. That would be great. Could you have materials that you know, change their properties with respect to the, the environment? So temperature, they you know, may change their color so that they become reflective or absorptive if you were interested in those properties. So there's something about maintaining the living properties of materials that I think is really compelling. 
Right. This absolutely amazing. This is also reminding me, this comes, I guess, out of a tradition of something that used to be called sort of smart materials, smart and intelligent materials. An idea there I remember being, you know, can you build a, a building that might have sort of uh, reactive porosity depending right. on what the humidity and what the meteorological condi conditions are. And so in some ways the building itself, just by changing its microstructure, uh, can accommodate. And, and so maybe you lose, use less energy to heat and less energy for AC. Uh, the thing that's amazing about this, though, is, is I'm imagining living inside of a building that is living. I love the thought of it, but I also it also gives me the willies a little bit. <laughs> it makes me feel like I might be living inside of a body. And I, so I wanted to, want you to think about that for a second. And it, I'm, I'm wondering, what should we be concerned about? Like, if I keep food in a refrigerator too long, it goes bad. I mean, so could my house go bad in this respect? <laughs> Yes, these are some of the things that we've asked our performers to be thinking about. So if you have a system that grows, how do you control that growth? And there's obviously a natural precedent for this, right? Human beings grow to roughly defined shapes and sizes and so on. So, so nature has solved this problem of controlled growth and development. We actually have a, um, a second track of the ELM program that is getting it just this question. So uh, can we program biological systems to adopt specific sizes and shapes? Okay, and I just have to say, so, so this is one of the most miraculous things to me about biology, about a seed, about a fertilized egg, because it comes with fairly simple shape. And I'm looking at you, Justin, and you have an interesting shape of a human being with all <laughs> I, kinds I of tissues. I honestly don't know how to take that, Ivan, but uh, thanks. In the, best of, <laughs> in the best of ways. So what a DARPA-esque audacious idea to actually now try to build that morphogenetic function of biology into engineered materials. Right. So you mentioned the seeds. We've been building with once alive materials forever, right? We use wood. And how do we get that wood? We take this single, this very, very small seed, we stick it in the ground, we grow it for 20 years, we get this beautiful living tree that you know, provides shade, it can you know, help heal itself, all these great properties. It can take CO2 out of the atmosphere and produce oxygen that we need to breathe. And then what do we do? We cut the damn thing down, <laughs> and then we put it in a kiln, we render it inert, we saw it up into um, dimensional lumber. So could you think about you know, starting with essentially like a, a tree progenitor cell and grow dimensional lumber? So the cells would keep dividing in a specific uh, developmental pattern, and they would know, they would be programmed to grow to specific sizes and shapes. So producing dimensional lumber without having to grow a tree. <laughs> So, Justin, that was an absolutely amazing discussion. You've taken me on, on a conceptual uh, journey that is just pleasing me no end. I just want to thank you for engaging me in this conversation. It's been my pleasure, Ivan. This has been a lot of fun. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. For more information about Justin Gallivan, his BRICS and ELM programs, and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website.